Hello everyone, today is Thursday, February 27, 2020, and it's the week in charts. All right, so what are we gonna talk about? Well, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for being here. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So obviously the elephant in the room is the market, and I'll have quite a bit to say about that, and we'll obviously get to the live charts here in just one minute. I saw a post this morning in Facebook and it was of a black swan with a, with a surgical mask, and I thought that was kind of cool. Usually, you don't have this well-announced bear market underway. In other words, it's not like, oh, it's a swine flu or whatever flu it is, a coronavirus, I guess, in this case. Usually, it's something more out of the blue, and we'll, we'll flesh that out as we get to the live charts. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them on the slides, and we should have plenty enough time when we get to the live charts to cover your individual stock picks. And on those, just ask about one at a time and hit return, and wait till we get to the live charts. All right, so I'm gonna continue to follow up on my ongoing quest, and my ongoing quest is to have the short-term pay, trading pay for the longer-term trading. My point is that if, I'll, if I succeed at that, I'll own the world. The longer-term trading, has its risk and has its problems and has its drawdowns and we're going to explore those drawdowns in, in this issue here and then it's going to be kind of cool i think hopefully cool to see how it all shakes out maybe we'll follow up on this next week but i'd like to show you what's happened so far and talk about that as i've been saying if i if i succeed i own the world because longer term trading has big steep drawdowns and the accuracy is abysmal, but that's where the money is. And those occasional outliers can make a year. I know it's like shoulda, coulda, woulda, but I missed one that I got knocked out of, and I did that mental math, of course, and it could have easily been a six-figure gain in one stupid little stock. So it could happen. And my point I'm gonna make in this presentation not that it will always work, but I'll flesh out why you need to trade this way. You just have to follow your plan. And I know it's hard. It's it's really hard sometimes. David Keller was emailing me on some business. He's head of technical research over at StockCharts.com. And as you know, I have a show over there. And uh, he just asked me, you know, what's going on with the market or how, how you fare? And I'm like, well, I, I think I'm going to throw up. And then I'm gonna clean myself up and I'm walk over to McDonald's and see if they're hiring. <laughs> and that's how you feel when you get your your ass handed to you. And that's why I get so angry at these quote unquote gurus that pretend it's so easy. Pretend is a keyword in that sense. But I don't want to get too caught too caught up in that and too sidetracked, I should say. There's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I hope to summon up all predictions or about the future and a lot of stuff stuff can happen between now and then and a lot of stuff has happened between now and then or then and now i should say so again my ongoing quest is to have the short-term trading pay for the longer term trading and not so much this week the free rolling because that free rolling is is we do have a few positions that are free rolling but we are giving up some open profits which is part of the process by the way i was rereading a little bit of Curtis Facebook, specifically where he talked about how Dennis, as I often preach, treated drawdowns to open profits differently. And that's something that I really have to wrap my head around. I mean, I have wrapped my head around it, but when you're actually, when your head's in a washing machine and you're getting beat up, it's hard to convince yourself that, hey, it's just open profits that I'm giving up. The ogre free money thing, I've been having uh, some difficulties with opening gap reversals lately simply because they haven't worked out. Now, we're going to see. I already got whacked today on one, and we'll talk about that in a little while. And I actually got back in, so we'll have to see how that's going to shake out. And another one in the TMV, I got long that one just a few minutes ago. And uh, the SPXL trade re triggered. And that's why I was a little late, or one of the reasons I was a little late getting started, I had to put some orders in on that. I'm using a trailing stop, and I'm using a limit order on those things. And I'll flesh those out as time allows. Now, as I've been saying quite a bit, borrowing a line from Fortune's formula about the Kelly formula, 
which is a very dangerous way to trade. Although I might use something Kelly-ish in a little count I'm trying to parlay as kind of an S and G type of thing. And if time allows, we'll talk about that. But we've been talking about that quite a bit in the Facebook group. Basically, Kelly formula says you should risk an inordinate amount of money based on the fact that you're going to be a certain percent correct. Well, the problem is markets aren't normally distributed. In other words, they don't adhere to statistics. If they did, they wouldn't be markets. In fact, if you knew you had an edge, as slight as it might be, then you would own the world if you were guaranteed that that edge always works. And without digressing too far, the, my point I always make is casinos, and if you forget about the slot machines and games like that, but the big games, the big money games, they, they have a very small edge, sometimes less than half a percent. But casinos are a multi-trillion dollar business because they can count on that edge to continue to work out. So let's talk about the short-term attempts at longer-term trades. And as time allows, we'll take a look at some of these ogre opening gap reversal trades. Now this week, again, I want to focus on hanging with your positions until and unless stopped out. Now here's the thing. The if you go back to I think it was Friday and the market's pulling back a little bit, you can't really make an argument there that, oh, I should get out of the market because that's normal ebb and flow. In other words, just the choppiness of a market, give a make a little, give up a little. If you exited on every adverse move, you would never, ever, ever, never capture a trend. So I guess the new, the next question is, well, what do you do when you come in on like a Monday and the market gets creamed? Is it time to cut and run? Kind of on that, oh, shoot. <laughs> Open a gap that does not reverse. Well, I'm going to make the case for sticking with positions. And at the end of this presentation, you'll see that maybe that might not work out. Maybe it will. And that's my thought process. I don't know how it's going to shake out. But I'm going to continue to follow the plan because if you abort the plan over the short term, you'll never make any money longer term. So let's just take a look at how everything shook out. So here is a snapshot I grabbed. And this is an account that's close to 100K. So a lot of the things I recommend you'll notice are in here and very close to the share size that I recommended on those. So here's the ARQT, there's 400 shares in this particular case. And if we take a look at the chart, it actually went up, believe it or not, on that ugly down day. So if we multiply that out, that's an $884 gain. And obviously, if you'd have bailed out on the open, you would have foregone that and any other gains that it makes subsequently to that. BRBR, 800 shares here. And if we take a look at the chart, it actually went up. So that's a $256 profit, even though the market was beginning to come unglued. Let's take a look at CUE, 300 shares. Those are 300 shares left over. So that's the short term, hopefully, and I just said hope, I know that, but hopefully paying for the longer term. And it actually went up. So that's a whopping $15 gain. Hoo -hoo. Well, you know. When you're getting whacked pretty hard on some of these, $15 is a good thing. So KOD, I had the wrong chart in here. But KOD, I think, I'll have to look it up. But I do have it written down somewhere. Oh, there it is. Wrong chart. But KOD actually went up $4.78. 200 remaining shares. So that's a $956 gain. And then O N E N. EM, I see what happened. The um, the charts in transfer. So ONEM, -E easy for me to say, had a 66 cent loss, 400 shares. That's 230, $264 lost. Now, ping uh, to those who are following along in the service, I should have stopped out on the remaining shares. I did give it a little wiggle room, and I haven't quite stopped out on that one. One problem that you could end up with is 
what I call a creeping loss, and I'll explain that towards the end of the presentation. A little discretion, I think, is a great thing. There are some downsides to discretion, but in this particular case, a loss of 58 cents, 300 shares, that's $174. PLMR, 200 shares remaining, and a loss of 158, so that's $316 loss. QTT actually did go up a little bit, hard to believe, I know. 1,000 shares on that, a little bit of a bounce. It's good for $220. SITM, 200 shares. In this particular case, I had made some mistakes on this trade. I actually should have more of this particular one if memory serves. But I have 200 residual in this particular account. And it went down a little bit. So that's a $60 loss on those 200 shares. Now, SPT got whacked pretty hard in here. And on 800 shares, that hurt pretty bad. So let's take a look at that. So pretty big drop, 0.17 times 800 shares, 936. So you look at something like this and you think, well, you should have just bailed on that, Dave. And well, today it's doing okay though. We'll take a look at that in one second. VERU, 2,000 shares. I haven't hit the profit target. I'm trying to get a buck out of this one. And it went down just a little bit of a smidge. So lost a lost 20 bucks on that trade. Actually, it should be 40 bucks. Okay. And then finally, AUY. I did not have shares in this one particular account, but just to show you that I have a like a similar account with shares in it. When they get allocated, sometimes I don't get them allocated at all out. And that's one of the downsides of using multiple accounts. One of the upsides would be like this morning where I triggered in to a losing trade in one account. By the time I got the order in on another account, the market had reversed so much that I actually put in a higher order. So here's the AUI, 1,500 shares. And surprisingly, gold hadn't gone up as much as you think it would with everything going on. But this particular stock went up six cents on 1,500 shares, so that's 90 bucks. And if we add all this up, it comes to actually a gain of 651. Now we're much lower than we were overall from the day prior, but you can't, you didn't know that you're gonna have that sell off, right? My point is, do you bail out when things begin to look ugly? And I'm gonna make the case that no, you don't. Anyway, but you don't bail out, you just follow the plan. Now it could end up ugly, we'll find out. So by sticking with it through yesterday, it actually went up. $651. Now we're down from where we started, way down. But by not bailing out yesterday, you can see so far, knock on wood, a little bit higher. And then we add in today's action, and we actually have a loss of $315. But overall, over the last two days, we have a slight gain. Now I can't promise you that it will always go up when the market goes down. And again, I think next week we'll follow up on this and in, in weeks, hopefully, and I know you said hope again, but hopefully we'll still have some of these open over the next couple of weeks and we'll follow up on the portfolio, maybe do an equity snapshot going back to Friday. And then let's see where we are a week or two from now. And let's see if following a plan is the thing to do. Now the SPT made a big move and that, helped tremendously it went up 3.3 points when i did the snapshot so that's 2600 dollars right there so it's too early to start kissing each other just yet but maybe that might be the one stock that saves us now here's some random thoughts on surviving a drawdown if it was easy everyone would be doing it and this is how i'm trying to wrap my head around this action, when I come in Sunday night and I see the futures are down 100 points or whatever they were down, knowing that I'm gonna get creamed on Monday. But, you know, it's amazing, you look on YouTube and this, whenever there's a bull market, it prints a bunch of these little gurus, these sweaty guys in the basement, claiming they've got the secret to the market. And it just really infuriates me, but I don't wanna get too far sidetracked on that. 
But again, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And this is sort of what separates the men from the boys. When you do have a drawdown like this, you don't freak out. And I mean, you might throw up, but don't freak out. <laughs> Just do the right thing. The point I'm trying to make is stick to the plan. Easier said than done. If I were not a public figure, so to speak, if I were not showing more and more of my actual trades and and, and feeling like I need to practice what I preach, I probably would be tempted to cut and run because it's just human nature. And it's one thing I was thinking about lately is I'm standing in front of my quote, my big trading computer, and we have this flight or fight thing built into us. And that's the neurology I'm always getting into. And you're kind of powerless and you're feeling like you want to do something, but just like you, you don't have that release and certainly you can't just run away. So it could be it could be really tough from a neurological standpoint. And you're going to be very, very, very tempted to bust that plan. Now, again, I don't want to make it look like just because we're up over the last couple of days here, I don't want to make it look like we're necessarily up since this market imploded. In fact, we got hit really hard. Beta gets hit really, really, really hard, as I often say. Beta meaning these more volatile stocks, more volatile than the overall market. Sometimes the bigger they are, the harder they fall when it comes to volatility, at least. So, yeah, we're getting decimated on the open profits. Make no bones about that. And after the dust settles, we'll take, again, we'll look at a snapshot from Friday. And we'll see how it all shakes out. And hopefully, I know I just said hope, but hopefully I'll have a very good case for following the plan. So again, your open profits have been decimated, at least mine have to some extent. But you never know what, what could still turn into the mother of all winners. And like I said this morning, I did get knocked out of one last week that if I wouldn't have been knocked out, I know it's like, shoulda, coulda, woulda, what would the world be without hypothetical questions? <laughs> but it, it could easily be a six-figure game. So it happens. So let's see how the dust settles. And no matter what happens, there's going to be a lesson, obviously. That's a great thing about being an educational business, right? No matter what happens, it's a lesson. But being consistent, I think, is the main lesson. And it could show that micromanagement would have really paid off this time. And again, we can't argue. We can't argue that we would have we would have gotten out on Friday because Friday was a very small blip in the overall big scheme of things. But Monday, yes, the big sell-off on Monday, you could argue that there would be some temptation to micromanage. And I feel that hope word coming on. But hopefully I end up with the mother all of all examples of why we don't micromanage and all it would take would be just one of those trades to take off one of my big problems is that i watch my equity curve way too much there's been many of days where i look at my equity curve and i see how many thousands of dollars i've lost and I'll get pretty bummed out. But when I look at the charts, I'll just see it's just kind of normal ebb and flow. And the market or markets, the stocks that is, are nowhere near my protective stops. So all that angst, all that stress is for nothing, at least provided, of course, I don't end up getting stopped out. But if you look at the charts and don't do all the mental math, it's a lot easier than watching that equity curve. And I'm kind of guilty of watching that equity curve. And I've got to work on this. I need to probably do more alerts and hard orders. Like this morning, I put in a lot of hard orders. Usually I don't put in a lot of hard orders, like actually place orders, because I'm here anyway. But usually I'll use alerts and things like that. This morning, just in case the the S still the S continues to hit the fan. The it it hit, continues to hit the fan. I have in a lot of orders in. And by the way, that's another thing too. I think can be a saving grace. You have to accept the fact that when they get hit, they get hit. 
But if you put in a hard order, you let the market make the decision for you. If you say, well, I'm going to exit at this level and that level gets hit, there's a chance that you could end up being the deer, the proverbial deer in the headlights. And then it just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. Now, I did lose my ass today on an opening gap reversal trade. I got in a little too, I guess in hindsight, maybe too aggressively too soon on SPXL, although I'm back in again. And here comes that hope for it again, but hopefully I don't add insult to injury. <laughs> we'll see though. So I guess the big question is where are we now with the overall market? So if we take a look at the S&P 500 and take a look at a weekly chart, we could see we're now down to the 50 week moving average. And if we close down here below, this is what we need to look at today's close. So let's just say round number is about 3000. That would be over a 10% drop from the 50 week closing high. And it would also put us below the 50 week moving average. So our longer term system would actually go to sell mode. That's a TFM 10% system. So it's kind of interesting because these numbers obviously were much, much bigger for this last trade was triggered on March 1st, 2017. So what caused that trigger? Well, we had two bars of weekly Landry light above the 50 week moving average, meaning that the two lows of the S&P 500 for two weeks, two consecutive weeks were greater than the 50 week moving average. And we were within 10% of all time highs. So that last trade was looking pretty, pretty good. But then you can see that quite a bit of those open profits, probably 10% more than what you're show, what's being shown here, were given up. So this is only if it stops out. The Not to beat the dead horse, because I've talked about this week in, week, week in and week out for many, many weeks. The designer's intent for this system was not to beat the pants off the S&P 500, although I wanted it to beat the pants off of the S&P 500. My main intent, though, was to avoid these big diaper change moments. Now, everything up until 10%, you're going to lose, okay? You have to give up at least 10% of your open profits or possibly even a 10% loss. But anything greater than that, you will avoid. So these diaper change things that I put over here or how much additional money you would have lost by writing out the correction. So you can see in a year like 2000 and 2000 and I guess seven, let's see, you would have avoided a 44% drawdown, additional drawdown, and then in this case, a 52% additional drawdown. So you kept half of your money that you would have lost. And that's the argument that I've made quite often, as ha uh, also has Greg Morris, is that if the market loses 50% of its value and you're in your average mutual fund or S&P 500 tracking fund or whatever, or let's just say mostly in equities, you're going to lose half of your retirement. Now, if that happens now, and you retire 20 years from now and the market recovery recovers, then keep in mind, it might take 25 years for the market to recover. Dave, there's no way that's true. Yes, it is. It took 20 something years from 1930 for the market to recover, I think 26 years or more. And the last little bear market we had, the last ugly, ugly bear market, it took 13 years to recover. Now, 13 years is a pretty long time, especially if you were looking to retire Tomorrow, you might have to work another 13 years. So anyway, that's a quick system update on that. Uh, when this triggers, this is a longer term signal, then I would say the market might be in trouble longer term. But over the short term, we just honor our stops on our existing position. So you can see I've got a, a nest ton of positions on. And if we start getting stopped out, we start getting stopped out. 
we might end up sitting in cash for a while, and then we might actually end up shorting. Now, as one of you guys, I think it was Jim Freeman pointed out, and thank you, Jim, for doing that. Jim stays on top of the market timing, which is kind of cool in the Facebook group. Looks like we all have our little specialties there. So Jim likes to do the market timing. He pointed out that there was a bow tie sell in the S&P 500. What's kind of interesting is it actually triggered on the Friday before the big sell off. And if we zoom that in, it's a little bit more clearer. You can see we had the bow ties crossing over the 10 simple, the 20 exponential and the 30 exponential and then spreading out again and then we had a lower low a lower high which gives you an entry down here now i don't directly trade these hourly signals but they are kind of fun to watch because patterns are fractal what happens in one time frame happens in others okay so let's hop out to the live charts let's see where we are and let's flesh these things out a little bit further and we're getting a question, okay, on opening gap reversals. Let's talk a little bit about opening gap reversals, and then we will get into the overall market. Okay, so let me show you my failed trade this morning. I know, a Goomba, a Goomba, <laughs> a guru, a Goomba. I wonder, what's a Goomba? A Goomba, Is that, that's probably something in Italian, right? So here's where I lost this morning in opening gap reversal trade. I triggered in right here. And then as you can see, it failed miserably, stopped out. And then I got long again right here, I think at 56.10, like right in here. And it looks like it's working out okay so far on that one, but I still have quite a bit to make up. Okay, on your opening gap reversal trades, do you use the opening range, 15, 5, 15, 30 minute, to decide we are going to go long or something else such as volatility ATR, okay. I would urge you to go in. We talked about opening gap reversals quite a bit. So go into the Q&A in the members area. And it's really a lot of those questions and answers. It, the, most of the Q&A session, or a lot of the Q&A, I should say, turned out to be a bunch of ogre lessons that are probably to separate those out and stick them in the learning management system under an actual course. They're kind of in the learning management system by default through the Q&A, which is actually sort of treat it as a course in and of itself. You can go in and take the Q&A as a course. There's no quizzes there, but you can see your progress by going through those. So I would urge you to go through those. If you were to look at the Q&A, you would say, well, this guy just trades open to gap reversals. Well, that's not true. The thing is, I get more questions about that than anything else, just like I get a lot of questions about my transitional patterns, such as the bow ties and first thrusts. Let's say you come in we get the gap lower like we did today, and then the market just begins to rally. Well, you have to have a spot in mind where you will enter the stock or whatever market you're trading. Now, sometimes it's a little easier to take a look at like the daily chart to enter these opening gap reversals. So let's say you come into today, you're like, all right, I'm going to play one of these opening gap reversals. I'm going to give it a shot. And you're looking at a daily chart. So you come in here and it says, okay, well, it gaps lower. And just so I don't get faked out, so here's your gap lower. Just so I don't get faked out, let me give it a lot of wiggle room. Let me maybe enter up here, okay? Now, my entry was right here. And I got it triggered in on a false trade or bad trade and it got stopped out. I don't know if this trade obviously that I'm in now is gonna make up for it, but we'll find out. So let's get back to the intraday entries, but sometimes looking at that daily chart can give you a little perspective and keep you from getting sucked in too early on an opening gap reversal. Now I did get sucked in this morning, truth be told, drop some met bombs. So what you could do is, Let's say it's not just a route higher like this, okay? Gaps lower and then immediately takes off. What you could do is, let's see if you could survive the first five or 10 minutes. And again, like when it's a case like this, the second bar begins to take off. This is where you need to say, well, I'm gonna put in an entry somewhere up here. If it gets hit, it gets hit. But sometimes you have the luxury of that opening gap range established and you don't trigger in. So again, I triggered in right here which in hindsight was too early, obviously. 
I went to my other account where I trade these open and gap reversals. And by the time I got there, the market had already done this, came back in. Because initially I was going to rush in and just put a market order in. I says, well, hang on, Dave, take, take a deep breath. And instead of putting a market order in because the market began to implode, it's like, well, let me just put an order in above this high. And we just got billed on something. I don't know what. I think the TMV, I don't know why it's still on my screen now. The TMV actually just hit the initial profit target. We'll talk about that one in just one second, too. So that'll be kind of fun. So anyway, I got triggered in. This thing imploded. I got stopped out. Okay. I actually lost a little bit more than I intended to on that. But now I'm back in. Let's just see what happens. So again, if you are lucky enough, and let me just clean this chart up. But if you are lucky enough to have missed that first fake out, and here's, here's the hard part, man. They're gonna they're gonna try their hardest. The market will do. I know it's kind of weird to personalize the market, but the market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of trades and to really trick you. Okay. So, but if you're lucky enough, like, okay, well, this thing is reversing, but I don't want to just jump in here. So I'm going to put an order up here. And it's like, oh, goodness, it, it imploded. All right. So I avoided that losing trade. So now I might go ahead and sense that order in a little bit tighter. And that's what I did is I said, well, let's go above this little high for my second entry. And we got triggered in somewhere around here, I think. And then so far, it's beginning to take off. So far, so good. So we'll see. So that's the SPXL trade. Let's see how that works out. Let's talk about the TMV trade. Let's take a look at bonds first. So bonds had the big gap open this morning. Now, Dave, I thought you were a trend follower. I am. But sometimes markets get a little euphoric and get a little ahead of themselves. The ideal opening gap reversal would be something like back here. See the market's kind of taken off nicely, pulls back. Let's say a gap like way down here. We're looking to play that reversion to the mean back the direction of the trend. ACMR was a big trade recently that worked out pretty good. And let's see if we can pull that one up real quick. So ACMR was one that I recently showed. And we'll go, we'll come back to TMV. But this is the ideal situation. This is what you you want to trade for the most part, especially if you're new to trading open and gap reversal. So here we have a stock that took off went kind of parabolic it pulls back you have a gap down here you look to play that opening gap reversal back in the direction of the trend and it makes it for a great little trade you're just in and out for an intraday trade and i call it an intraday trade because it's not a day trade because what you want to do although technically it is a day trade what you want to do is you want to be able to ride that stock as long as possible and then hopefully, and I just said hope again, but hopefully get in fairly early and then stick with that trade for the remainder of the day. So here's bonds. So I was taking a look at TMV. And I don't know why I'm not getting filled on that. I should be. So with TMV, let's take a look at the opening gap reversal. So we've got a gap way down here. But Dave, you're fighting the trend. Well, I know. That's what I call a burning dog, or actually Linda Rasky calls a burning dog because she had a guy in her office named Genghis that would fade every opening gap. And the burning dogs, the way I define a burning dog is something that's at brand new lows. And this is the inverse of bonds and leveraged. So bonds would be at all time highs. This would be at all time lows. And you're looking to play that reversal. So let's take a look at what happened intraday. Let me see if I could shed some light on my thought process in bonds. So bonds open up and they zigzag around a little bit. And I ended up with an entry at 825. Cause it's like, okay, well they zigged around, zigged and zagged. And then it's like, okay, well, let me, let me have an entry way up here. That way I won't get caught up like I did in the SPX L on a false move. And you can see they came back in. Then they came up and I triggered in at 825, okay? Once your opening range is established, then you could say, well, anything above this range, I need to think about being long and where's my stop gonna be? Somewhere down here, because if it does trigger, it goes on to make new lows, you have to get out of the way. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day, just like I got my ass handed to me in the SPXL. 
but I'm still able to, I'm still here, right? And I'm back in again. So on this TMV, this bar here at 825 triggers in. So I just kind of eyeballed it and says, well, if it gets down here below whatever the slow is, let's just say eight dollars i am like really i'm not only wrong i'm like really really wrong so what i did was i said okay well a25 let me add 25 cents to that because i've got 25 cent risk and then that's going to give me an initial profit target here at 850 and that must have been another fill that just came through and i forget that i could check my phone on these things so that's my initial profit target and my risk was 0.25 25 cents. So what I did was I put a trailing stop in at 25 cents. So this is going to ratchet up as it moves in my favor. And then I'm going to say hope again, but hopefully it'll trigger this initial profit target. I'll lock in some gains and then this stop will be at break even. And then all I have to do is relax. And then at the end of the day, Maybe, just maybe, this thing keeps going higher. I trail this stop higher, and then I exit market on close. And that would be an excellent thing. Okay, so that's kind of a long-winded answer. Did that make sense on the opening gap reversal and how we play them and what we're looking for? Do not play burning dogs and in individual issues. In individual issues, you want to play them in the direction of the trend. I'll give you an example. I forgot that I have, maybe that was my order that filled. I have an order in SPCE for today, okay? And you can see it at big gap lower here. Let's take a look and notice that, that this thing is going parabolic, okay? So maybe this is just the mother of all knockout moves. Maybe we have the mother of all reversals today. Let's take a look at a five minute chart on that. And you can see this one's this one's pretty cut and dry, right? what happens well a gap lower it did have a little bit of reversal but if you just kind of sit tight and say well i'm going to put in a, a little bit higher entry maybe or let's just see how that first five minutes shakes out it begins to implode so this right here becomes your new entry for that opening gap reversal now keep in mind there's going to be a little bit of temptation to try to bottom fish in these things and i would urge you not to because if you look at these things, it's going to look fantastic. It's going to look like, oh, man, I'm just going to buy this thing. It's super duper oversold. Well, you're playing that reversion to the mean trading game, but you're trying to catch the falling knife in the process. We are trading reversion to the mean with the opening gaps, but we're waiting for that. We're waiting for that knife to bounce. OK, and hopefully it's turned around. OK, Donald says good explanation. So I've reached one person. All right. <laughs> Was it Mitch? I can't think of his last name. Mitch Hedge something, whatever. He says, you can't uh, please all the people all the time. And all those people were at last night's show. All right, let's take a look at the market, as ugly as it is. S&P 500 has imploded as of late. But we are getting a reversal intraday, okay? And I'm going to say that word hope again, but hopefully my XP, my SPXL position works out nicely. There's SPXL. And so far, we've got a nice little reversal on the way after, of course, the mother of all fake outs. So decent reversal underway. Market severely oversold in here. And the thing is, and the reason, and, and maybe I'm getting sucked in a little bit more than I should. But my thinking is, you're probably like, Dave, you're trying to follow, what are you doing? Well, the market is so stretched to the downside that what's going to happen is when the short covering starts, shorts are a fickle bunch. They pile on and then they hold on for dear life. And then they start getting squeezed. They all run to the door at the same time. And it creates a vacuum to the upside. So that's what I'm kind of banking on happening eventually but my timing so far has been off luckily yesterday borrowing a term from linda rasky ended up being just the cost of a pizza party for me i know a couple of you guys scratched out or made a few bucks trading the opening gap reversal i was i'm not in it for a penny i'm in it for a pound i'm in it for 
an intraday trend higher. I want to get in as early as possible and I want to ride that trend all day long. Okay. So my goal via a trailing stop would be to ride this intraday trend all the way back to hopefully, and there's that word again, hopefully the plus column and beyond, but to hold on as long as possible. I'm not in and out, in and out, in and out all day when I talk about these day trades. Okay. I've got the TMV trade on right now that's working, which came really close to that limit order for my initial profit target. Just can't seem to get there just yet, but it will. <laughs> Wishful thinking, huh? And then I've got the SPCE order on that never did trigger. And the TM the TMV I just talked about. And then obviously the SPXL went in the second time on that. So we'll have to see how it shakes out. But S&P 500 looking pretty ugly. Somebody was saying, and let me see if we could do it here. Yeah. Somebody, it might've been Mr. Warden here in um, Telechart said the S&P 500 next target would be 200 moving average. And that was a couple of days ago. I'm like, geez, I don't think that's gonna happen. But lo and behold, like a magnet, it went all the way down to the 200 day moving average. There's nothing magical about the 200 day, but it does give you, give you a pretty good reference point. And as a general statement, if the market's above the 200 day moving average, you want to be long. If it's below the 200 day moving average, you want to be short. Years ago, when I was doing consulted with, consulting with people and trying to help them build trading systems, they'd come up with something they thought worked. I'd prove to them that it didn't work, and they would say, well, throw a 200 day moving average at it. Lo and behold, it would start working. Because, as a general statement, you want to be long if the market is above its 200-day moving average, and you want to be short if it is below it. Now, there's lots of caveats I would add to that, but as a general statement, as you can see, that would mostly keep you on the right side of the market, just like if we get rid of the 200-day moving average in here and just put a leave a 50-day moving average. And we look at a five day chart, which I guess would give us a 250 day moving average on a daily, I suppose. So here's a weekly chart. So let's add in a 50 day moving average. There it is, 50. And then let's take a look at a weekly chart. So the TFM system, basically one of the components is Landry light. So you had Landry light here, lows greater than the moving average, lows greater than the moving average, low highs less than the moving average. Lows greater than moving average here, and then for most of this run here, and then for most of this run here, and then this last run we've been in, we've had nice little Landry light for that whole run. By the way, look at your bear market. I know I've said this a thousand times, but look at your bear market of 2007. Look at the, all the Landry light you had to the downside. Almost that entire bear move, you had Landry light. So. This is one of those things that just absolutely amazes me is something as simple as Landry Light could help to keep you on the right side of the market. I wouldn't trade that in and of itself, but I think it's definitely a tool that's worth using. So that's where we are on a weekly basis. I'm not gonna get too upset until and unless we take out this 50 week moving average, meaning that we close below it, which would also put us right at 10% below the 50 week closing high. And you can see right now with this little bounce underway, we're less than 9% away from all time highs. All right, Donald says, my contrarian thinking tells me that a lot of people probably puked their guts out on this this morning, maybe, and hopefully the market will go higher from here. Yeah, you know, getting back to that hope thing once again, what I was hoping for this morning's open was the mother of all gaps, like you said, to to anybody who hadn't puked yet, to help them puke up their positions and then have a nice reversal. And, you know, there were a lot of things that had me nervous recently, but as a trend following more, and I try not to overthink it, it's like one of my friends from Mississippi, he's since moved away, but he was visiting a few weeks back and he's like, Every day I look at my portfolio, I'm making a $900, $800 a day. <laughs> He's kind of a cross between uh, Ross Perot and I'm trying to think of who else. But if you start with Ross Perot, you can do a pretty good accent. Anyway, he makes fun of me too, so I can make fun of him. He makes a lot of fun of me. 
But it was kind of interesting to hear him like, you know, talk about how fantastic this market is. And I'm a man on the streets kind of guy. We had a little bit of a spill a few weeks back and then I start, my phone starts ringing and friends start looking me up. Dave, what's going on? It's like, well, it's just a little bit of correction. I wouldn't get too excited just yet. So a lot of people piling into this market and this is a, a bit of a cleanse that's happening right here. In fact, let's take a look at like a weekly chart. See on a weekly chart, that would be a trend knockout, okay? Because you've got a pretty good trend, a little bit extreme, don't get me wrong, but still a trend knockout. Nonetheless, we take out this high in here, then it could be off to the races. But now we have quite a few inf inflection points. If we close below this 50-week moving average, I would begin to get really concerned. Now, again, I know I'm beating the dead horse here. It doesn't mean that I'm not honoring stops. I think I got stopped out of one or two already this morning okay i and that's you let the ebb and flow control your portfolio let's see how this all shakes out amazingly we still have quite a few positions on that weren't knocked out so maybe this was just the mother of all hits mother of all drawdowns to open profits and then we go back to making new profits okay maybe and hopefully the market will go higher from here yeah i mean let's let's just see what happened i think uh, happens i i think the I think the coronavirus is a big deal, but I think everybody, they seem to be on top of it now. I think China might have been a little too quiet for too long. There's a lot of conspiracy theories going on. And I mean, you know, you want to wipe out the world, come up with a virus, and then come up with an anecdote for that virus and a vaccine for that virus, and then just sit on that anecdote and vaccine and release the virus to the world. So that could be pretty ugly. Now, they might not have gotten around to creating the anecdote and the anecdote? Anecdote. An anecdote is a is an amusing story, right? Anecdote? Anyway, but maybe they haven't created that just yet before they released it. NASDAQ Composite, nice little opening gap reversal here. I mean, it, you can't kiss all the women. I was looking at, uh, I think it's TECS and a bunch of other things, and I decide, anecdote. A-N-T-I-D-O-T-E. Antidote, okay? Antidote. It's weird, you know, you do a presentation and these words are sometimes just don't come out. <laughs> it's crazy. NASDAQ Composite, we're still down a percent and a quarter on the day. You can see we cut through that 50-day moving average like butter. Let's see where the 50, 200-day moving average is. 200-day moving average way down here, still is a way to go, ways to go to get there. It did get really stretched to the upside. The $52,000 question, or $64,000 question, I guess is what it is now with inflation, is, is this the beginning of something? I don't, I don't know. And I think we'll know when we see it. So far, we have to see if we take out today's low, if we close below major moving averages, especially like on a weekly basis. Here's your 50-week moving average in the NASDAQ composite. Let's see, what would you sell out? We're down 9%. So if you were using the 10% system on that, which I actually don't, I use that on the S&P 500, this number might be a little bit bigger than 10%, maybe 15% based on the volatility. But if you close, let's just say for all intents and purposes, you close below a 50-week moving average, it's in trouble. Now, what happens next is going to be crucial. And that's why in yesterday's stock chart show, somebody said, hey, is this correction over? Is this correction? Is the store so bigger? And I said, I don't know. And I got to things like, I probably look like an idiot. But we have the gap lower, which means extreme weakness. We have this thrust here. So if this market rallies up and then stalls out and begins to roll back over, I would become very concerned about it. And Greg Morris mentioned that bear markets don't start from brand new highs. I need to figure out what he meant by that. But usually you don't have a bear market right off a of new highs. And I'll have to try to do the research. I have to do the research on that. But usually you get some sort of consolidation and it becomes more of a process than an event. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Although it always feels like it's a it's it's an event, like, oh bam, market's selling off. And hey, we're in a bear market. Okay. The the shit's hitting the fan. But more often than not, it turns into a big old process. Now, lows, believe it or not, or more as a general statement of an event, okay, than a process. Now, speaking of process, let's pay attention to these bow ties. What might happen, these are the daily bow ties. 
And in the S&P 500, you can see they're coming together really quickly. But what happens is when a market implodes, it kind of makes what I call a forced bow tie as opposed to the normal little gradual rollover. And that was the designer's intent, was to capture a gradual rollover in the market. When something sells off this hard, this fast, like the P's and the NASDAQ, the moving averages are a little slow to catch up, even the exponential moving averages. So I look more, I'm look, well, I always look at price first, but I'm more concerned about the price action than the action in the moving averages when you have a big slide like this. We have bow ties on all but the Qs and the daily. Well, the NASDAQ is not quite a bow tie yet, right, Craig? And then the Qs, Q, Q, Q. Qs have a way to go before they bow tie. Let's take a look at the Ps. The P's have not officially bow tied down yet, I don't think. Let's just double check this. The 10, no, the 10 is still above the 20, but that could obviously change really quickly. Okay, 850 is a top tick thus far on TMV, most likely explains why you haven't gotten filled. Yep, but hopefully I'll get filled. The good news is, not that I wanna trade for mediocrity or to scratch but the good news is where the trailing stop is now worst case scenario i'll scratch out on the trade i know i'll still drop an f-bomb but <laughs> let's take a look at the rusty the rusty is pretty ugly let's see what the moving averages are for those keeping score so the 10 is still slightly above the 20 so technically it hasn't bow tied down yet but it will soon because these lower prices being added on and these higher prices being dropped off will just force that thing to work. By work, I mean crossover. So let's clean this chart up. Rusty is a bit of a bummer, and I've been complaining about this guy forever. This is a Russell 2000. We finally got out of this stupid big old picture retrace range that we've been in forever. So it looked pretty good in here. But then now we're back to imploding. And on a micro level, if you go in and look at the service last couple of weeks, I was complaining about the fact that we made this kind of gatekeeper looking reverse check mark. If you want to say head and shoulders, fine, shoulder, head, shoulder, whatever your favorite topic pattern is. But I was hoping, I don't know, hoping one hand and you know on the other and see which just fill first. But I was hoping that we take out these recent lows and this recent high. And obviously that hasn't happened. What's concerning to me is that we've come all the way back into this sideways soup with the Russell 2000. So Russell 2000 remains a bit of a bummer. What has me really concerned here, although gold itself did get a little bit of a bid, there has been a lot of throwing the baby out with the bath water lately. If you go in and look at all 239 of these Morningstar industry groups and last couple of days, there's been some days where there were like two that ended marginally higher and they're just very small sectors that really don't even count as far as like photography. I mean, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't even know what stocks are still in photography, but it ended higher and one other one. But what concerns me is that some of these defensive areas like consumer non-durables, okay? You're gonna still use toilet paper, if there's coronavirus, you might even use more toilet paper, right? But you would think that there'd be some flight to safety in something like consumer non-durables, but nope, there has not. Drugs, which can be considered a defensive area, have been imploding a little bit in here. I guess on a relative basis, doing a little bit better than most areas. Biotech, on a relative basis, kind of hanging in there. I'm, I'm selectively bullish on biotech. I'm still long, a lot of biotech, and then there's been, it's kind of like an individual issue basis. You have a few taking off here and there. This one here makes me want to throw up. I was long this one from way back here in the teens, <laughs> and I got knocked out. But this is the point I'm trying to make. I mean, this is a, that's a six-figure move right there on an account. Now, this is a bad example because it didn't work, right but early, story of my life. No. Will they say the big chart? That's the same thing, Michael. <laughs> so I'm not wrong. I'm just early. So I was right, but early. Anyway, this is why we hold on and honor our stops 
Because trust me, now I got stopped out of this one. That's fine, okay? But if I would have bailed out on this because the market was getting iffy, right? And then I come in and I could have made six-figure gains in one day, I, I might jump out the window in my office. And now I'm up about five or six feet. It used to be ground floor, but we have a raised house now. So I might hurt myself jumping out the window now. Energy is banging on new lows in here. Metals and mining, banging on new lows. For the most part, no place to run, no place to hide. And even gold, gold's done okay, gold stocks that is. But you can see we're pulling right back in. So we're not really not really taking off in the golds just yet, although they might be some golds that are worth going after. I saw one of you guys talking about a couple of gold stocks in the group, and we'll have to flesh those out. We're long AUY, as you just saw a minute ago. Nice little breakout, pulling back a little bit. So far, so good. Silver not doing so hot, you can see. I mean, relative strength base is doing okay, but really didn't see an extreme flight to safety. Now, the only thing that we did see was we did see a flight to safety in bonds. And if bonds wouldn't have rallied on this big sell-off and gold went down and consumer net durables goes down and everything else, that would really scare the bejesus out of me. That's the so-called throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Banks, which looked ugly before all this happened, look even uglier. It's always darkest when, right before it gets more dark. But as you go through these sectors, a lot of them look like the overall market. Sometimes when the market tanks, everything goes down with it. And that's pretty much what's happened. I don't want to bore you. I know too late and go through too many of these. But you can see that hardware, software, semiconductors have imploded as of late. The list goes on and on. So for the most part, no place to run, no place to hide. All right, let's open it up for individual questions. I'm sorry, individual stocks, anything you guys want me to look at. I'm always early day. Yeah, that's okay, though. All right, you guys let me know, and I'll just let me check some orders while you're waiting on trades. I just mopped an F on that TMV better get there. <laughs> All right, SDGR. Yeah, this is one that I was recently long uh, for shits and giggles. I said, because somebody was joking in Facebook and said, hey, uh, some guy just turned 14000 into $4 million on, on, uh, on YouTube. Why can't you do that, Dave? Why are we following you? It's like, All right, well, let's see. Let's see if I can do that. And luckily, the first trade was SDGR around 35, ran it up 10, 20 points, and took partial profits, got stopped out. I think last week at this time, we were taking partial profits doing the weekly charts. I, I don't, it's not jumping out of me as a pullback just yet. I'd actually like to see a little bit deeper pullback. Today's high, if today's high were a little further down, uh, definitely keep it on your, on your radar, but I don't think it's set up again, Donald. ATRC. This is one that I have on the Landry list. By the way, I didn't have any new setups coming into today for today, simply because I think this was on the Landry list, although I don't like it as much as I did before. One thing I sort of don't like is that it kind of pulled back all the way to where it was back here, now that I'm looking at it. I think it looks okay. The long, yeah, the longer term, it did accelerate higher. So yeah, that's why I liked it longer term. So yeah, I still like this one, although. It is kind of interesting that's pulled all the way back to where it was back in January. But yeah, that one's that one looks okay. I think you could certainly do much worse than that, Chris. Beam is a pullback. I got knocked out of Beam, but I am thinking about it. Again, with IPOs, sometimes you have what's called the first deep retracement. They take off, they get a little far ahead of themselves or get a little bit ahead of themselves and then pull back. So yeah, I think that one could work, Donald, for sure. All right, any more? Anything else you want me to look at? Any more questions? C-G-E-N. You took the two T2 short. All right, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at C-G-N first. Yeah, this looks pretty good. There's a little bit of a gap here that would concern me normally a little bit. But in this particular case, the whole world's kind of come unglued. Ideally, I'd prefer if it didn't have this gap lower. But it's kind of interesting with today's action. The only issue is... You've already got this outside day up. I, this high 
I prefer to be a little bit low based on this run because it's ran up 100% over a quick period of time. I'd like to see a little bit. This is a deep enough pullback, but it kind of it's it's kind of not setting up. Let me see if I could try to explain what I'm show. Try to explain what I'm saying. So it's pulled back nicely. So that would be a decent pullback, but it's already rallied up here. I'd actually prefer if it if it would have let's say did something like this. And then you can have an entry somewhere up here. So by the end of the day, it may not be set up, is what I'm trying to say. So we'll have to see. But that'll have to go to the watch list. Right now, I've been looking at all of biotechnology because even though the sector got whacked a little bit, a little bit, there's selected strength within biotech that's looking pretty damn good right now. So yeah, good eye on that one, Donald. Too, T2 too short, let's see, TWO. Yeah, that looks kind of interesting. This was on the Landry list a while back as a short. I didn't feel like we had to rush out to the short side. And then in hindsight, I noticed it's not coming up all time highs, but fairly close to all time highs. So that looks okay. I just didn't feel like going, I didn't feel like we had to go out to shorts with the market at all time highs. And then now the market's selling off, it's gonna take a bounce for us to start seeing some shorts setting up. So I'm not afraid to short. I think we have one short left over in the portfolio from a long time ago. So I'm not afraid to short. It's just we need to wait for setups on the short side. Okay. All right. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Well, obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered? Dave at DaveLandry.com. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much.